Okay, so when I chose the title Security and Privacy in the Information Economy, I was looking for the most provocative bunch of buzzwords that I could find. And what is it I was trying to provoke? Well, I was trying to provoke an image something like this. Okay, this is an Information Week magazine cover. And the headline is Internet Theft. Online bandits will steal $10 billion worth of corporate information this year. Catching them won't be easy. This is one of zillions of headlines and mainstream media stories about computer security and about cryptography and about information commerce. So why all this hype? Why has this rather obscure niche academic field of cryptology and security that some of us have been working in for ages now, all of a sudden become front page news. So the short answer to that is that we're now in an information economy, and I'll say more about what I mean by that term later, but we're now in a situation in which people want to conduct daily business electronically, business that they used to conduct in the physical world using paper and pencil. So. Why does that make things that used to be considered rather obscure, like cryptography, front page news? Well, there are at least two major changes that have taken place in the past few years. Um, one of them is that media that we use every day are now less secure than the media we used to use every day. I have this transparency with two columns on it. On the left, there are traditional, familiar, inherently secure media. On the right, we have sort of corresponding, newfangled, inherently less secure media. And there's been a shift to the right column in the last few years. So we can focus on the second row here. If you think about doing commerce with paper documents, you'll realize that there's a lot of your daily life experience that gives you confidence that you know when you're dealing with a legitimate document and when you're dealing with an illegitimate document. For example, you have an intuitive sense of when you're looking at a copy versus an original, of when you're looking at a signature that was just signed, and when you're looking at one that was erased or tampered with in some way. Even if you don't have an intuitive sense, we have legal mechanisms, and we have trained professionals and experts, and we have court precedents and all of this stuff that allow us to actually sort out for any particular transaction whether a paper document is legitimate or not. We don't have anything like that with digital documents. A digital document is a pile of bits. The distinction between an original and a copy is really not all that meaningful in some cases. If you're a computer user and you get a digital document and you pop it up on your screen, how would you have any idea whether it's a legitimate document or not? So that's been a change. Media are inherently less secure. There's also been an enormous change in scale. Okay. Um, we used to deploy cryptography and security mechanisms in an extremely small scale world. Cryptography was for a long time the province of the military and the banking industry. There was a relatively small amount of very well-defined information that had to be moved around, and there were comparatively many trained professionals to deal with it. Now we have the internet becoming a mass market phenomenon. We have inexpensive computers and communication media that are very fast and very high quality. And we have a potential need for tens of millions, possibly ultimately hundreds of millions or billions of nodes on the internet, all using cryptology and security mechanisms, all shipping around information that is of vastly differing values, some of it very valuable, some of it less valuable. Its value determined by commercial markets. And we're trying to use technical mechanisms that we developed in a very different context on a different scale. So that makes everything very challenging and also very newsworthy if it doesn't work. All right, so 
I mentioned information economy, another uh, buzzword that you'll hear a lot of and that you know, is part and parcel of all this media coverage about security and cryptology is electronic commerce or e-commerce. And that's really sort of two things, one of which is more complicated than the other. We can talk about electronic commerce in regular, real-world, tangible goods. So a good example of such a, a commercial enterprise would be the, Am the online Amazon bookstore. Okay, here we have the sale of the sale and purchase of traditional physical goods, namely books. But instead of doing this in a traditional bookstore, they're doing it on the internet. And that raises information security concerns. Okay, for example, do you as a customer care about the privacy of the fact that you're buying certain books? Okay. If you were walking around a bookstore, you'd probably feel secure that nobody was looking over your shoulder and taking copious notes about what you're buying. How do you know what's going on when you do this on the internet? You don't. Now, a more complicated question is what about commerce in so-called information goods and services? Okay. We can now create all kinds of new products because we have these widely available computers and communication devices. And we can talk about um, selling goods that are just completely electronic. We can talk about selling electronic documents. We can talk about selling uh, all kinds of consumer information that wouldn't be available if we didn't have this information economy, if we didn't have this widely available computing and communication power. So. Um, Creating a business to um, sell, to do, say, um, software distribution online, okay, to eliminate shrink wrap packages for those of you who go out and buy PC software, is more complicated and raises different issues from creating um, a business to sell tangible goods like books. And one very important problem, which I'll say more about later, is so suppose you create this digital product. You know, you sell your software simply as an electronic file. How do you present, prevent your customers from reselling it? This is generally not a problem with a book, because if your customer takes his book and resells it, he no longer has it. If he takes this electronic file that you sold him, he can copy it, sell it to someone else, and he still has it. Okay. So those are sort of categories of e-commerce questions that arise in the information economy. And this is a computer science conference. What, are, what do computer scientists have to contribute? Well, I guess one of the main points I'd like you to come away with from this talk with is that computer science can contribute you know, very, very broadly and widely here. Okay, I've drawn this um, transparency as though it were a network layer diagram, you know, as if each one of these layers builds on each other. So I have, you know, for example, um, computational models, systems and languages, networks and protocols, applications and implementations. But these aren't really like a tower of things that build on each other. They are to some extent, but not completely. They're really more just a um, highly connected graph of areas in which computer scientists can contribute. And actually, I would say already have contributed. I think that we have some stupendous accomplishments in um, you know, the mathematics and the algorithmics of cryptography. We have some really, really you know, useful and potentially even more useful cryptographic pro protocols and payment protocols and all kinds of mechanisms to protect privacy. And that's probably not that controversial. Something I would assert that maybe not every computer scientist would agree with is that it, we actually, as computer scientists, we actually could solve some of the social and legal and political problems that are you know, arising and in some sense are holding back the full flowering of the information economy. And I'll get to that at the very end of my talk. All right, so let's focus a little more specifically on what kinds of problems might we hope to solve if we have the right technical mechanisms. 
And then I'll get into an actual specific technical mechanism that computer science has contributed. So imagine a web-based publishing business. Okay. You want to create, you are a producer, say, you want to create and sell digital documents of some sort. They might be computer programs, they might be books, they might be articles, they might be some as yet undiscovered form of document that is enabled by all of this computational power. Okay, so you want to start this web-based publishing business. So the dream, the sort of the metaphor or the, the image of the information economy is that now that we have the internet, or more generally, now that we have very, very widely available computation and communication, the publishing business no longer has to be done the way it's traditionally done. You no longer need to have a few, or maybe not very few, but you no longer need to have a very highly capitalized, well-organized, high barrier to entry publishing business. If you're an author, you no longer have to rely on some well-known commercial publisher to sort of put its stamp of approval on your material, physically produce it, and then distribute it in stores. Okay, you can just create it, put it on your web page, and have people buy it directly from you. So that's a very nice image, you know, though that's, that's a provocative image in any case, that you would have, say, a billion people, ultimately, uh, all using the internet, which means you have a billion potential producers and a billion potential consumers and a billion squared potential commercial relationships. So this, you know, as I put it that way, becomes maybe a little bit more uh, questionable as to how you can actually carry this out realistically. So what are some of the components of why that might not be that easy to do? Okay, so I think I've already mentioned what I'm calling on this transparency information rights. Say I'm, I'm a producer. I, do I actually have the right to produce whatever I want and put it up on a public web page and have people buy it from me or have them take it from me for free? Okay. Do, is, is this something that is guaranteed to me as an American citizen? Suppose I'm not an American. Is it guaranteed to me by wherever I live? Is where I live actually even relevant to this question? Given that if we're envisioning doing this commerce in the internet, it doesn't really matter if you're an internet node. It doesn't matter to you anyway what country you're in. Okay, so what rights do I have in terms of what information I produce and what rights do I have about consuming? If I'm a, you know, an internet user, do I actually have the right to download whatever it is I want? Okay. So how about logistics? I've said that there are potentially a billion squared commercial relationships. Well, how is that actually supposed to work? Okay. If I'm a potential producer, I want to create some document and put it on the web and sell it, how do I find my market? How do I find my customers? Okay. If if I were doing this in the paper world, I would go to some publishing company that had some traditional way of selling things, and I would hope that whoever my representative in that company was, that it would go out and market my book, and it would be effective. Now we've cut out this middleman. How do I go and find my market? If I'm a customer, how do I find what it is I'm looking for? I'm no longer going to a physical store where somebody's, it's somebody's job to display all of the goods that you know, the likely customers are going to want to find. I'm just there on the internet where, in some sense, everything looks the same. What kind of technical mechanisms can we put in place so that I can actually go and find what I want? It's, it's nice that now there are a billion publishers, but that's obviously more than I can consider one by one. So logistics are a problem. Uh, information integrity. How do I know, if I'm a producer, that I can put my goods up on the web and they won't be tampered with? By the time my potential customers see them, nobody has altered them in any way. They're really what I put up there. If I'm a customer and I'm looking at something that I want to pay for, how do I know it hasn't been tampered with? How do I know that if I 
click or in some way indicate, yes, I want that, that what's going to be delivered to my machine is really what I think it is based on what I see on this nice screen full. Okay. Payments. Am I, are we going to use traditional payment mechanisms like checks and credit cards, which are not internet-based? In other words, are we going to use the existing financial system to pay for information goods and to pay for all the stuff we buy in the information economy, or do we need new payment mechanisms? A big area of research is so-called electronic cash, creating little tokens that you can ship around in purely electronic form and pay for stuff. Well, how is that really going to work, and is it worth it? Do we need it? Uh, business models. Right now, um, those of us who use the internet for commercial and sort of semi-commercial activities, as well as for the traditional non-commercial uses of the internet, um, are a little bit frustrated. At least I should say I'm a little bit frustrated, because there doesn't seem to be any kind of sensible business relationship that I can have with any merchant on the internet. Um, I go and try to use various services that are marketing themselves to me on the web. But nobody, in general, when I use these services, in particular search engines are like this, when I go and use these services, um, the way they're actually paid for is that the people who create them are paid by advertisers. Okay, so this is a very non-traditional and perhaps problematic way of selling services. Okay, a web-based service provider like a, you know, someone who builds a search engine, for example, what's actually going on here? He puts up this web page, he invites people to come and use it and click on it. How is he making money? He's being paid by advertisers who want the users to see their advertisements. So if I'm a user of such a service, there's someone who's created a service that is supposed to be good for me, but I'm not the one who's paying for it. Some third party is paying for it. Okay. So there's been a lot of hue and cry about if I use services such as search engines or if I use any of these web-based services, how do I know that the fact that I use them and various other information about me that can be gleaned from the interaction with my machine is not going to be used for targeted advertising or for various other you know, nefarious purposes. You know, how do I know that the private information about me that's being collected through this transaction isn't going to be used against me? Well, why is this an issue? Okay, why should you care about this? Well, because you should be concerned, as far as, I'm, as, far as I can tell, that you are allegedly you know, buying a service from someone, but you're not paying for it. Or you're allegedly getting a service for someone that you're not paying for it. In a traditional commercial relationship, the service provider is paid by the people whom he's serving. In the internet today, he's paid by a third party. So that's a potential problem. Just to go on with that theme, I've written down here information ownership. Okay. I, I've implied through my previous example with, you know, what are the business models here, that information about me as you know, a citizen of the information economy, information like you know, the usual who I am and where I am and, and various demographic data, you know, now becomes a commodity. The, fact of, the facts about what I buy and when I buy it now also becomes a commodity. Now, this isn't totally new. Those of us who get junk mail all the time know that this has been a fact of life ever, at least since credit cards came into existence, and probably was always a fact of life for marketeers. But now it's become a very easily capturable fact of life. All kinds of information about you as a consumer and as a citizen now become ver becomes very easy to capture and sell. Okay, it becomes a commodity in the information economy. So who owns that information? And what are the rules about how it should be used? And what are the technical mechanisms for how to use it? So I should say now that when I say that I think computer scientists 
have a lot to contribute to the social dimension of the information economy. Part of what I mean by that is if we're going to answer these questions about information ownership and how should information be used and who has a right to sell it and how, we're going to need technical mechanisms that allow the owners of information, assuming we decide that there is such a thing as an owner of information, we're going to need technical mechanisms that allow owners to state their preferences, to state their policies, to make contracts with people with whom they want to trade information and do you know, electronic commerce. All right, so those are some of the issues. And I want to shift gears now and talk about a very critical technical mechanism for this whole range of activities that I've alluded to in the first part of the talk. Um, this is a, um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, digital signatures. And digital signatures are actually a very, very broad and deep and I think a remarkable achievement of computer science research already. And they, they enable it, or could enable a vast range of electronic commercial activity. So this is something that we as a field can already take a lot of pride in. All right, so let's start with the sort of traditional paper analog. Right, let's, let's talk about signatures as we're used to them on paper documents. So I have a picture here of a set of K different documents that I allegedly have signed. Actually, what I put there was my initials, JF. But you know, if this were a legal document, I'd write my whole name. And one thing that you should notice here is that my signature is the same on all of these documents. Okay, when I sign a document, it's just the way I do it and the way it looks to anybody looking at that document is just a function of me and how my handwriting works. It's not a function of the document. The signature looks the same on all the documents. So I wrote here that um, you know, digital signatures are trickier than the paper analog. And the reason that I put analog in quotes is partly because as I just said, they're not really analogous. The way you do digital signatures is not really totally analogous. The other reason is that I'm not sure that that's how you spell analog. Anyway, so how does it actually work in the digital world? Okay, why can't we just have some computer program that I run every time I want to produce a signature? So I just sit there, I produce a signature, and then I subsequently go and attach it to any document that I want to sign. Well, we can't do that because if I could just unilaterally run a function that produced Joan's signature and then later attach it to a document and ship that document around as a pile of bits, well, anybody could take the signature part out of that package and reattach it to something else. So if the signature is just a function of me, as it is in the paper world, then it can be, uh, my signature essentially could be forged, or more to the point, it could be replicated without my knowledge, without my cooperation. Anybody who had a paper, a digital document and an independently created signature by Joan could detach the two and put the signature on a different digital document. So this can't happen as easily in the paper world. Why? Well, you can't take a paper document and just rip it apart and attach part of it to some other half document that you ripped apart and not be detected. But with bits, you can do that, or at least potentially you could do that. So there's sort of the crux of why are digital signatures not analogous to paper signatures and why are they trickier? Well, this is actually a very well-developed theme in computer science theory. And a digital signature scheme has three parts. The first part is the key generation stage. Um, if I want to be a participant in a digital signature scheme, I have to run a randomized algorithm called the key generation algorithm. 
So I put in a pile of random bits, and I get out two things, a public key and a secret key. In this context, the secret key could also be called the signing key. Okay, and the idea is that these are in one-to-one -one correspondence. For each signing key, there's a unique public key and vice versa. Each participant has his own pair. So that's why we have the initials JF as subscripts here, because this is my secret key and my public key. I take my signing key and I keep it private. I store it in my machine in a tamper-proof and secret place where no one else can get at it. That's very important because it essentially identifies me to this scheme. The public key I go and I put in a public directory so anybody can go and get access to it. So subsequently, if I want to sign a document, I use the signature algorithm. Okay? I take the document and my private key, I stick them into the signature algorithm, and it produces something I've called SIG here that stands for signature. And the key point about this digital signature is that it's a function both of the document and of me, namely of my signing key. If somebody else wants to forge my signature on a different document, he won't be able to do that. Why? Because I'm the only one who knows my secret key, and I've kept it in my machine where no one else can get at it. All right? So this signature is not just a pile of bits that can be attached to any document and will look real. Why not? Well, how is signature verification done? Well, there's another algorithm you know, cleverly crafted so that it dovetails with the signature algorithm. And to do verification, anybody who needs to do it can go look up in the public directory what, who, what is the public key of JF. You know, the claim is this is JF's signature on this document. Well, go and look up the public key of JF, take the document, the signature, and the public key, put it into the verification algorithm, which either accepts or rejects. Right. So if somebody tried to forge my signature and ran the signature algorithm with a secret key that does not correspond to my public key, this verification algorithm wouldn't work. Okay. So that's the whole point. These secret key and public key pairs and the signature and verification algorithm pairs are all cleverly crafted and based on you know, inherent mathematical relationships that prevent substituting someone else's key for mine and still getting the right answer. OK, so that's the point. It's trickier than paper documents, essentially because the uh, signature has to depend on the document and the person. OK, can't just depend on the person. So let's go down again. Remember, I had this uh, diagram in which I showed all the ways that computer science can contribute. And one of the ones that was sort of low down in the stack was mathematics and algorithmics. So let me tell you a, a mathematical idea that has been developed in the theory of computation and that is extremely crucial to this whole question of digital signatures and enabling electronic commerce. So that's the idea of one-way function. So a one-way function f, OK, what is it? Well, essentially, and in an actual very mathematically precise way, it's a function that's easy to compute. So you can take x and get f of x efficiently. But it's hard to invert, even if you know what the function f is, okay, you know what it is mathematically, and you have a value y that is f of x for some x, finding that x, okay, inverting the function f is inherently computationally intractable. Okay? So quickly and efficiently, you can go from x to f of x, but to get back to x, from f of x takes a lot of time, takes more time than is actually feasible given the kind of resources that would be available to anybody who'd want to do it. Okay. So there's, this is a very, very well-developed theory 
in computational complexity, um, it is not known, it is not provable completely based on, you know, no assumptions whatsoever that one-way functions exist, okay? There are many examples of functions that are conjectured to be one-way, and I can tell you the easiest one. Uh, ordinary integer multiplication is conjectured to be one-way, okay? There are very readily available pairs of numbers, say, P and Q, that you can get your hands on and multiply very quickly to produce the product, say, N equals P times Q. So if I have P and Q, that's the, that corresponds to the input X, I can multiply them and get the product N that corresponds to F of X. But if somebody gives me N and says, well, there are two numbers P and Q such that P times Q equals N, now go find them, there's no quick and easy way to do that, at least none that we know of. We haven't, unfortunately, been able to prove that there could never be a way. But after, you know, extensive study, nobody's been able to come up with an efficient way of doing that. And it is one of the most well-studied computational problems in history. Um, uh, resolving the question of the existence of one-way functions would actually entail resolving the central problem in the whole theory of computation, the so-called P versus NP problem. So this is not something that we expect to be resolved anytime soon. But nonetheless, we do have a very good understanding of one-way functions and how they fit into the theory of digital signatures. And in fact, it is provable that one-way functions are both necessary and sufficient for digital signature schemes that are not forgeable, okay, for, for effective digital signature schemes. Um, the uh, necessity of one-way functions is actually fairly obvious, and I'll show you that on my next transparency. I should say that the person who proved that all you need, you know, the sufficiency, the, point, the, the one who proved that all you need for one for digital signature schemes is one-way functions is someone called John Rompel, who after a brilliant start in theoretical computer science is now working in finance. So that tells you something else about computer science as a field and what it has to contribute to the information economy. Anyway, so why are one-way functions obviously necessary for digital signatures? Well, remember the key generation algorithm step, okay? I, if I want to use this scheme, have to go and stick a bunch of random bits into a key generation algorithm and get out a public key, private key pair. That's step one. So let's consider the function that takes these this random bits, runs the key generation algorithm, and then throws out the secret key and just produces the public key as an output. Okay, so the projection of the key generation algorithm onto the public key component. That better be a one-way function. In whatever the mathematical definition of one way is, this process better, better satisfy it. Why? Well, suppose that this function were easy to invert. I've already said that the public keys get put in some public directory somewhere. Anybody can get his hands on them. So, if I could invert this function, I could go and look up somebody's public key in a public directory. I could figure out what random bits he used when he, used, when he ran the key generation algorithm. I could go and run the key generation algorithm, and then I would know both his public key and his signing key. So I'd now be able to go around forging his signature. Okay, that obviously would not work, and that shows the crucial value of one-way functions for the theory of digital signatures. Okay, so just one more word about digital signatures. There are a bunch of schemes that have been written about in the literature and actually implemented and tested. The Rivesh, Shamir, and Edelman scheme, RSA, being a very well-known one, uh, the security of it rests on the multiplication function that I discussed before actually being one way. So in particular, if there were an efficient method for factoring, okay, for taking n and finding p and q such that p times q equals n, the RSA signature scheme would not work. 
you would be able to figure out people's signing keys. Uh, the El Gamal signature scheme and the digital signature algorithm put forth as a, a standard by NIST. The one-way function inherent in that one is uh, based on the so-called discrete exponentiation, the modular exponentiation function. So I won't go into that because, you know, it'll just take too much time. And the only other thing I want to mention, the reason I put the McLeese, the, I mentioned the McLeese scheme on this transparency is that um, the McLeese uh, scheme is not based on number theory. The underlying one-way function has to do with coding theory, error-correcting codes. And I think in the public mind, sometimes people think um, public key cryptography is just applied number theory. So uh, number theory is extremely important to us. It's contributed a lot, but it is at least um, in principle possible to construct public key crypto systems and digital signature schemes that are based on something other than number theory. All right. So let's, uh, for the last part of this talk, just go back to our um, electronic commerce world. Go back to the idea that we're going to do web-based publishing. Okay, and we're going to use, among other things, digital signatures to do web-based publishing. So let's say that Bob is a garage programmer. He wants to develop useful software and market it. He doesn't want to go through some big company that might distribute his software by shrink wrapping it and putting it into retail outlets. He wants to just take his code, put it up onto the web, have somebody use it. Okay, so. Here we have this website, www.bobsoft.com. And Bob has his program P that he thinks would be very useful. So of course, he's concerned that this program actually be associated with him. Okay? He doesn't want someone else claiming this is Bob's software. He wants to go and build a reputation as a really good programmer, so lots of people will buy all of the code that he writes. All right. So he takes his program P, and he takes his secret key, and he runs it through some signature algorithm, and he gets a signature block, let's call that SP. So he puts the code, let's say object code or source code, however, however he wants to sell it. He puts it up there on the web. He puts the signature up there on the web. He publishes his public key in some public directory, and he's in business, right? OK. So Alice comes along. She's the potential customer. Somehow, we don't yet know, this is one of the problems that I mentioned before that I'm not going to tell you a solution to in this talk. Um, somehow, Alice wants to um, buy Bob's software, and she's found him. Okay, she's looking for a program that does what his program does, and she's found Bob's website. So she goes to the public key directory. She looks up his public key. She verifies that. The signature that she found there really is his, so this really is a legitimate copy of Bob's program. And the verification algorithm works, so she downloads the program. And we hope she pays Bob for it, and that she doesn't go and resell it and undercut him and ruin his business. All right, so from the signature point of view, is this a solved problem? Hey, is the fact that Bob can put his his product, you know, the program he's written for his software business, up on the web and sign it and put the signature up on the web and publish his public key, is that, is that enough? Does that, does that form enough of an infrastructure to do e-commerce? Well, not clear. And the way, the, a, very, a very crucial question um, that we'd have to ask is, when Alice goes through this looking up Bob's public key and verifying the signature, does she have confidence that she's got the right key? And in fact, what do we mean by, is this the right key? The whole theory of digital signatures and public key crypto systems posits that any user, any participant in this system, like Bob, can just go and place his public key in a directory that anybody can access. And subsequently, anyone who wants to verify his signature can just go and look it up. Why might that be a problem? Well, if this public directory is really so widely available and anybody can go and put stuff in and take some stuff out, how do we know that this public key hasn't been tampered with? 
How do we know that I haven't gone and put my public key into the directory entry that says Bob? So now I can go and sign stuff and put it up on Bob's website, and people will suspect that Bob's written it. So I could you know, have some control over his reputation as a producer, for example. Anyway, so the traditional meaning of this question, is that the right key, is what I just said. Has the directory been tampered with? Is this binding, is this mapping from the name of Bob's company, which I've called Bobsoft, and the public key associated with it in the directory, is that an accurate mapping? Is this really the public key that Bob put up there when he generated his key pair? Or has some tampering gone on? Or has some mistake been made by the person who's, gener who's maintaining the directory? Okay. In other words, traditionally one thinks of these public key directories as something like a phone book. Okay. Anybody can go and look in the phone book and if I have a listed number, you go and you look at the number that says, that has Joan Feigenbaum next to it. And we have a lot of trust that, you know, at least traditional phone companies know how to make accurate phone books and distribute them. So can we replicate that through social mechanisms and technical mechanisms in the electronic world? Well, this potential problem was noticed as soon as public key cryptography was proposed. Okay, it was said, oh, it's all fine and well to say we'll have a phone book of public keys, but there is no such thing out there right now. I can create a, a file, but people could change it. And how would we maintain it? How would we make sure everybody had access to it? And the solution proposed by a guy who was at that time an MIT undergraduate named Kohnfelder. Um, the proposed solution was that um, there would be specific you know, individuals or there would be a specific service called certification. There would be entities called certifying authorities whose public keys would be extremely well known. So I have on this transparency something called PK sub CA. That's the public key of a certifying authority. Everybody who wants to use this system has to have some reliable copy of that certifying authority's public key in his or her private space. So Alice would have to keep that private, just as she would have to keep her own secret key private. All right, so if, we, if there's a certifying authority and his public key is very widely known and is not tampered with, we can use that to bootstrap trust in other public keys. So instead of having a public directory in which anybody can go and stick his name and his public key, and potentially anyone else could go and tamper with it, you have a public directory in which you publish names, keys, and certificates. So if I'm the certifying authority and Bob wants to get his public key certified. He comes to me, he tells me the name of his company and his public key. I take that pair and my signing key and I stick it into the signature algorithm. Okay, so the document is the mapping between Bob's name and Bob's public key. The signing key is the, that of the certifying authority. The signature that comes out is called the certificate for Bob's key. What gets published in the public key directory is Bob's name, Bob's key, and Bob's certificate. How does this work? Well, subsequently, when Alice goes and looks up the public key in order to verify some signature on Bob's program, she first verifies that this key really was signed by the certifying authority. She takes the public key of the certifying authority, which we've already hypothesized is well known and is not tampered with. She takes that public key, that one public key that she knows, and she runs through the verification algorithm, the name key pair associated with Bob and the certificate. And if that verification step checks out, she knows that this mapping between Bob's name and Bob's key is accurate. Okay, so I don't know whether you followed that whole explanation, but just bear in mind that 
the key point is that if you have at least one public key that you know to be trustworthy, okay, if you have a certifying authority whose public key is well known and has not been tampered with, you can bootstrap the trust that you have in that key by using the verification algorithm to convince yourself that if you've looked up someone else's key, say Bob's, in a public directory, you've gotten a trustworthy version of his key. Okay. That's the traditional theory of public key certification. And I claim, I and my, my AT&T colleagues claim, that that is the wrong meaning for the question, is this the right key? It's the wrong meaning for the information economy. It might be the right meaning for certain smaller scale applications, but for the web publishing scenario that I just outlined, where Bob is a garage programmer and he wants to write his code and sell it by just putting it up on the web, this is the wrong meaning of, is this the right verification key? Now, why is it the wrong meaning? Well, suppose Alice did that. Suppose Alice went and she got Bob's program, and she got the signature, and she got Bob's key, and she verified that it really was Bob's key, and then she verified the signature on the code. What would she then know? Okay, how would she know whether this is really something she wants to buy? In other words, who is Bob? Okay, I've hypothesized that Bob is an arbitrary person in the information economy. Alice is an arbitrary person in the information economy. This is just one of the a billion times a billion potential commercial relationships that are out there. How does Alice know that if Bob signed this program, that's a good thing? I mean, I've set the whole thing up so that Bob is unknown. If Alice were buying Microsoft software and all she was concerned about was that this really was the version that was shipped from the Microsoft uh, factory, so to speak, and that you know no competitor or potential competitor had altered it, that would be fine, because she knows what Microsoft is. So if she knew she had some Microsoft public key and it hadn't been tampered with, that might work. But that's not good enough. That's not realizing the dream of the information economy. That's not enabling this image we've all been fed of anybody can be a producer and anybody can be a consumer. So knowing that this is Bob's public key and this is Bob's signature when you don't know who Bob is doesn't help you. Okay? What you really want to know, and I, I think I've mentioned the word trust several times, is Whosever key this is that signed this piece of code, is this, is, is the corresponding signature key something that I trust in this context? Okay, does the signer of this code comply with my policy? Okay, if I'm Alice and I want to go out there and be a consumer of stuff that's published on the web, I have to have my own policy about what kind of stuff I want to buy, about whom I trust, about what companies I trust, about what kind of uh, certification by any type of commercial entity I need if I want to, if I want to buy something. Okay? So keywords here are trust and policy. Okay, if I'm a consumer, I presumably have my preferences about what I want to buy, and the, the use I want to make of digital signatures is, is this really something that complies with my notion of what I want to buy? So in, continuing this context of web-based software publishing, here's some kind of policy that I might have if I'm a consumer. I might say that whoever signed this program, you know, whoever the code source is, uh, it's got to be approved by the Software Publishing Association. So I'm using SPA just as an example of something that might certify a producer as competent. Okay? Bob, if he wants to you know, get ready to go into business, might go and get a certificate by some authority 
like the Software Publishing Association that says he's a good programmer. You should buy the stuff that he writes. Okay. If I'm a consumer, I might say, I want every site from which I buy anything to be approved by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Why might I want that? I might be concerned about privacy. I might want somebody to have said, I've checked out these people. The way they run their site is sound. They don't collect a lot of information about their customers and then sell it in ways that are going to cause that, cu cause that customer to get harassed. They're respectful of their customer's privacy. I may require that these approvals be obtained within the last six months. Because after all, the whole point about uh, web-based commerce is that it's very, ch it's very fast and changeable. Okay, entities that were in business six months ago may not be in business now, or they just might have changed hands, or you, know, you need to get all these approvals updated periodically. All right, so notice that these policies are complicated. There's a lot more than just mapping names to keys. There's um, multiple uh, sources of authority and auditing. There's multiple dimensions in which you know, somebody who crafts a policy might want to get approvals. I've mentioned competence and privacy, but those are only two of them. Um, you know, I might care about physical location. I might care about all kinds of things before I want to buy something from somebody I can't see and have never met. Uh, there are timeliness concerns. There's a lot more than names and keys. So that's part of the take home message of this, that the whole traditional notion of a public key certificate is really inadequate for information commerce. So the way we look at it in the group that I'm working with in AT&T is what we call trust management. We want there to be tools, which I've encapsulated in this black box here called the trust management system. We want there to be tools into which you can, if you want to buy something, say, if you want to process some kind of request, like download this program and run it or download this program and pay for it. Okay. You can also put in, you or Alice here, you are the consumer. You can also put in your policy. You know, what, what are your preferences and what do you expect before you plunk down your money or your, your e-pennies or whatever. And so there's the request, there's the policy, and you also want to put in a pile of credentials. Okay. In other words, um, Bob, if he wants to sell stuff, should have some proof that the stuff that he's trying to sell complies with his customers' wishes, you know, satisfies their requirements. Right? So I've already mentioned one type of credential that's a traditional public key certificate, a traditional signature by a certifying authority binding a name to a key. In the real world of electronic commerce, we're going to need more elaborate credentials. We're going to need proofs that objects that are sold electronically actually comply with much more complicated policies than who produced this. Is this really Bob's? Right. So we want to be able to feed credentials, policies, and requests into the trust management system and get out an answer about whether or not this, this request really complies with my policy. So in the software business, you know, does this program actually have the characteristics that I, as a consumer, expect it to? So the trust management system that I developed with Matt Blaze and Jack Lacey at AT&T Labs um, is called Policymaker. And um, remember, on my previous transparency, I had a black box called the trust management system. And this is the box into which your application would plug a request and a policy and a set of credentials. And the point of the trust management system is to decide whether the request complies with the policy. So one important feature, one important sort of philosophical thrust of the policymaker system is that the black box that we've designed is a uniform mechanism. It can be used in many different applications including, say, a web-based publishing uh, uh, software distribution system like the one in my example with Alice and Bob. Um, 
it's the mechanism for deciding whether a request complies with the policy doesn't depend on the particular semantics of the request and the policy that are relevant to the application. So we have an application independent uniform mechanism. I've written programmable metadata up here. That's because another important aspect of Policymaker is that it has a very rich and expressive way of specifying policies and credentials and requests. We don't believe that a very simple you know, format would be sufficient for the range of e-commerce applications that people are talking about. And finally, just one other aspect of Policymaker that I want to mention is that we're very set on local control of policy. We want every user and every installation where the trust management system is running to have the ability to set policy. In particular, because we think in electronic a commerce applications, each consumer and each producer has to be able to state its own preferences if this whole market mechanism is supposed to work and if we're really supposed to be able to do the kind of stuff that we can now do in the paper and pencil world. So if we had a very robust trust management infrastructure out there, one of the things this would enable is the creation of new kinds of markets. And in particular, we could create a market for all kinds of electronic credential issuers. Note that in my example, I said that if you're someone who wants to buy software over the web, you might have a policy that says you only want to buy it from programmers who have some sort of certificate from the software publishing agency, and you only want to download it from sites that have some kind of certificate from the Electronic Frontier Foundation that says that they respect users' privacy. Well, in that example, the SPA and the EFF are playing the role of credential issuers or certifiers. They're going around auditing producers of things and saying, yes, these producers have certain desirable characteristics. If you're a consumer, you can trust them in this respect. So you could imagine a very, very wide variety of credential issuers, people who have expertise in auditing and in judging all kinds of electronic goods and all kinds of electronic merchants could make a business out of issuing credentials. And that's one of the things that our you know, AT&T Labs notion of trust management hopes to enable. Okay, so I just want to conclude by saying that I think I've covered a wide variety of problems that computer scientists can contribute to. When I wrote down on this transparency that these are half-solved problems, I wasn't sure that half is really the right constant. I mean, I think there's a lot of problems that are more than epsilon and less than 1 minus epsilon solved you know, for some epsilon. But what I'm trying to get at here is that this is a very active area, this whole security and privacy area of research. There's been a lot of foundational work done. And there's a lot of interest in it. But it's not like everything is completely worked out. There's a lot of really interesting work to be done, actually developing and deploying a lot of the basic crypto system ideas, sewing all of this into a real electronic commerce infrastructure, hooking it up with all of the new laws and customs and commercial practices that are coming into existence. And there's really a lot of good opportunity for computer science research right now. You will have an audience if you do this kind of work, but you won't be working on stuff that's essentially already solved and only has minor details left. So I just want to end on that note of encouragement and hope that a lot of you will start working on this stuff.